Welcome everyone to the webinar, Health Equity in the Time of COVID, Fixing Broken Systems to Serve Communities of Color. Impact Health is very excited to co-host this webinar in partnership with Community Campus Partnerships for Health and the University of North Carolina Center for Health Equity. These two organizations are trailblazers, hosting weekly webinars that examine the disparate impact of the virus on vulnerable communities. Before we get started, I'd like to review the logistics for the webinar. Your phones will be muted, and we encourage you to use the Q&A box on the right side of your screen for any questions. And after the guided discussion, we'll have about 10 minutes for uh, answering your questions at the end of the webinar. If you experience any technical difficulties, please email events at impactint.com. Also, we encourage you to live tweet this event by using the hashtag HealthEquity2020. So it's my uh, pleasure uh, to introduce IMPACT President, Dr. Adeze Enekwechi, who will moderate today's discussion. Adeze is an experienced social determinants of health researcher who is committed to creating a more equitable healthcare system. Prior to her time at IMPACT, uh, Adeze served at the White House Office of Management and Budget under President Obama and oversaw over $1 trillion in spending on all domestic federal health care programs. I'll now turn it over uh, to Adeze. Thank you, Kevin, um, and thank you all for joining us. As I'm looking at the list here, we have a lot of participants, um, which is wonderful. I think it shows a hunger and an interest in having this conversation because the times certainly call for it. We've brought together a wonderful, diverse group of experts to share their insights on how we can support vulnerable communities during the COVID crisis and sustainably advance health equity in this country. I know we have a lot of people listening today. More people are joining as we speak. I just want to manage expectations. We are not going to solve many of the very complex challenges that communities are facing. But we do want to have a constructive conversation and, and learn from this wonderful group of experts uh, because they are doing things that are working in their respective um, settings. So let me introduce our panelists. I'll start with Al Richmond. He is the Executive Director at Community Campus Partnerships for Health, a nonprofit membership organization that focuses on health equity and social justice. They do this through partnerships between communities and academic institutions. They're based in North Carolina. Al is a global thought leader advocating for the increased role of communities in research and public health. The next is Letitia Reyes-Nash. She's the Director of Programmatic Services and Innovation and the co-lead of the Center for Health Equity and Innovation at Cook County Health, a public healthcare system that operates hospitals, community-based health centers, correctional healthcare services, and other public health operations. They serve 127 municipalities in Cook County, including the city of Chicago. Patricia was named a Culture of Health leader by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for her efforts to initiate projects that promote health equity across the country. The next is Sherry Wilkerson. She's the Chief Operating Officer and, and the Director of Plan Operations and Administration at AmeriHealth Caritas. Louisiana, a Medicaid and CHIP managed care provider that brings a coordinated approach to healthcare with tech technology solutions and community programs. She will share how AmeriHealth Caritas is shifting its activities to provide valuable services to its community members during the pandemic. Last but certainly not the least is Dan Broman. He is the CEO and co-founder of Unite Us a company that uses its tech technology platform to help medical and social service providers connect and improve community health outcomes. Dan, we know Dan is um, you know, a wonderful uh, speaker and a passionate believer in the work he does. Dan is a recipient of the Jefferson Award for Public Health and was recently added to Business Insider's 30 People Under 40 Changing Healthcare. So with that, um, 
as our introduction of this wonderful panel of speakers, let me turn next and set the stage for why we are here. This is a busy slide, but it's busy for a reason. Um, I think all of us who are on a call, and certainly those of us about to speak today, are aware of the issues that we're facing um, when it comes to the public health crisis, the pandemic, and how there has been disparate uh, effects on, so, on certain communities based on social factors and socioeconomic status. Social determinants of health experts were certainly not surprised uh, with the existence of COVID disparities, but I think the magnitude of those disparities were shocking, even for the most uh, seasoned or uh, perhaps even cynical among, among us. Um, recent data suggests that African Americans and Latinos are two to three times more likely to die from COVID than Caucasians. In certain areas like Chicago, New York, New Orleans, even North Carolina, African Americans make up the majority of COVID-related deaths, even though they are a much smaller proportion of the population. The growing data lays bare what we have always known, but we've collectively done very little to address. And in fact, when you look in the literature, for those of us who are researchers, and I know a lot of the folks listening here are, we have very thin research, like you know, quality research actually on this subtopic. Disparities in health, economic, and social well-being are exacerbated in times of crisis, and they lead to devastating consequences for already vulnerable communities. So the fractured U.S. healthcare system is failing to protect the most vulnerable during this global pandemic. And if you think about um, that outcome, and you think about the gaps that exist even under the best of circumstances, you can see how this, just, this is an area we need to pay particular attention to. Um, slide six, thank you. A lot of interrelated factors are at play, and the result is high levels of infection and deaths in communities of color. There's already a high burden of existing medical conditions, unaddressed social needs, inadequate and inconsistent messaging on public health issues, and a general mistrust of public health and medical professionals for a reason, lack of access to medical care, maldistribution of testing and testing capacities, even sometimes within the same communities or the same city, and increased exposure to disease through the workplace. You tend to have certain people working in certain industries, like meatpacking meat industries, uh, with you know, not, not normally distributed um, risk associated with contracting COVID-19. So these are just a few of the issues that have led to where we are today. This is not an exhaustive list by any stretch. I think as of yesterday, we officially crossed the 100,000 people who have died, which anyone in EPI or health services knows that that is a, a, a non-count by a significant number. So an awful situation where we have a number of preventable deaths, many of whom are seniors. Um, and we can have an entirely separate webinar just on that, the fact that these are older adults for the most part that are disproportionately affected. Um, but I just want to set the stage um, and talk about how all of these factors are contributing to where we are. We have an undercurrent of implicit bias and structural racism, which has led to sort of the, the non-ideal space that we occupied before the pandemic. And now we have all of these factors causing basically um, uh, a series of cascading effects for some of the most vulnerable people in the country. Um, hopefully our panelists will, well, I know that our panelists are well equipped to speak to um, any of these that touch on the work that they are doing but again, to share best practices, what is working um, in your work in, lo in local places or more nationally, a couple of our folks can speak to a more national footprint. And so with that, I want to ask the first question. I want everybody to address this question, but perhaps I'll start with Al. Which pieces of this broken system reflected, Al, on this uh, chart does your uh, work touch on? Which, you know, what, what, what does your organization typically 
addressed, and since the start of the pandemic, what's been happening in the communities that you serve and how your activities yeah. have shifted? Thank you. There's a um, community campus partnerships for health is traditionally focused on um, building partnerships between academic institutions and the community to address issues associated with health disparities. In recent years, we've kind of refocused our work or um, really honed in on the, the impact and the importance of work around social justice and health equity, in particular around structural racism um, and structural inequalities. And I think that uh, what we see today in terms of not just the impact of COVID-19 in the U.S., but globally, uh, and when we look into Africa, we look into South America, what we're seeing is um, structural inequality. So the work of CCPH really just is at the core of this, of better understanding how uh, these systemic factors brought us to where we are today, and that unless we address these systemic and institutional factors, we will not be able to get out of this current quagmire that where we are. So I think that you know CCPH work spans this particular um, model, but also looks at implicit bias and certainly structural racism. Okay, great. Leticia, maybe I should turn to you. Same question: Which pieces of this broken system? Do you and does your organization touch on both before and now in the current crisis? You're on mute. It's interesting because I think that as we, you know, right before um, uh, COVID um, surfaced, if you will, in Cook County, we had a summit where we were um, really discussing structural racism and also looking at um, how the health system was addressing social needs, and so. A lot of what we have been doing and deploying, or, you know, because uh, Cook County Health serves everyone regardless of their ability to pay, that's our core mission, um, the population that we serve and the people that we serve um, are dispro you know, disproportionately um, impacted by um, all of these structures that are in place at, that mm -hmm. um, prevent um, success in a number of ways. And so um, our health system as a core of our strategic priority has been to have advocacy. And so um, to work on advocacy for our patients, for the people we serve. And so through COVID-19, our health system has been truly advocating for um, folk, for people experiencing homelessness, the justice involved, um, families and patients who, uh, regardless of their status, insurance status or uh, immigration status. And so it, w it became extremely important for us to continue to be advocates for um, populations that often get uh, ignored and, and, and have and, – and, get um, not uh, uh, understood when you're looking at kind of community-wide um, uh, efforts and not understanding how we have to have efforts that are uh, within these disparate com uh, in disparately impacted communities. And so we've strongly uh, continued our advocacy role both in the city realm and in the um, suburban realm. Um, we targeted um, working to engage high-need patients to engage uh, them in telehealth, um, and I know we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, we also worked on reaching out to patients. Um, we do an assessment uh, around social needs for all of our patients. We have about 5,000 individuals who are in our care coordination unit who are part of um, that care coordination unit have, who have been determined to have high needs, so we worked hard to reach out and engage with those patients to identify if they have social needs, medication management needs, um, all of those different things. Um, and then we also did, um, we worked on creating linkages to community resources like food. And again, we had already been working on addressing food, so we had food trucks that come to our clinics to provide food. We just doubled our efforts. And so really, a lot of the work that we've already been doing um, to reduce, the, you know, we work as a, in a partnership to reduce the jail population. Like that work mattered when we came, when this, when COVID occurred. We had already reduced the jail population by 30 percent. And so while we still needed to work to um, reduce, to continue to ensure that individuals who do not need to be in the jail are not in the jail, we had to redouble those efforts. So really, I think COVID highlighted that we have been working in the spaces we need to be working in and that we had a, a platform to be able to continue to communicate the urgency of addressing these issues. But the one thing that I always say to folks is that people don't fail in systems. Systems fail people. And we have to continue to understand that 
when we have systems that are designed for the outcomes that we don't want, we need to really focus on how do we work on redesigning and changing those systems. And I will say, a couple weeks ago, I felt really optimistic that we were in a place that we were ready to like really disassemble systems. I don't know where we are right now. I think that we have to really think long and hard about what we need to do to actually disassemble and build systems that work for people. Um, and so, you know, I'll leave it there. No, that's no. We, 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 I think we're going to unpack a number of those topics as we go on. So thank you for teeing us up. Um, Sherry, if I can put you on the spot and ask the exact same question, which pieces of this broken system that Letitia was just talking about does your organization traditionally address and how has that changed, if it has, during the pandemic? Well, as a safety net health plan, um, AmeriHealth Caritas administers the Louisiana Medicaid benefit to approximately 213,000 members across the state of Louisiana. Um, our membership is often the sickest of the sickest with co-occurring um, conditions. Uh, they are the working poor. They're your essential workers uh, working in the service and the grocery industry, often living in multi-generational living arrangements or unstable housing. Um, we provide two community-based wellness centers where we meet members exactly where they are within communities most hit by COVID. Um, our work is, uh, continues to center around linking members to a uh, medical home um, and timely and appropriate primary and preventative care providing uh, complex care coordination and linking member to social services. That work has continued and has increased tenfold. Um, the things that have changed about it is the method in which we're doing that. No longer are we out in the field dealing with our membership in a face-to-face -face manner um, as peers and parts of the, and participants within the community, but we're doing it telephonically. We're doing it via two-way text. We're doing it via Zoom, like we're doing our presentation today. Um, and we're doing that with both our community stakeholders, our government partners, as well as our members. So um, that impact um, has, felt, has been felt across our entire organization. We're also having to impact and touch areas that we historically have not. Um, with children mm -hmm. at home, we are having to develop information and resources related to homeschooling and education. Um, as well, we're having to broaden our um, mental health programming that we offer to our members in a unique forum, such as Zoom. Um, many of our self-help programming, such as AA, NA, are now being offered via Zoom. So interestingly, the method in which we do our work has changed completely. I think you've teed Dan up perhaps perfectly. Dan, um, and thank you for that, Sherry. <laughs> it was not planned, but it's working out that way. Um, Dan, can you talk about where you play um, in this, in this uh, broken system? What are you trying to fix? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, and I think we, we play a role in probably the majority of the things that are presented on the screen and also you know, the majority um, of the issues that people have already discussed today. Um, Sherry, even just going last around all the things that, that are required as we think about not just what was occurring in people's needs before COVID, um, but also how that's been exacerbated by COVID and the true need um, for a public health response um, into addressing both health and social needs. So for seven years, we've been focusing um, not just how we connect people with both health and social service issues, but most importantly, as a community and as a network, how do we track everything that's happening with our clients outside our four walls together as a community? Uh, that's where you know health is moving. It's in the community, and that's where we need to meet people where they are um, and how that's addressed. Um, and so a lot of our approach is not just technology. That is the means of how we communicate um, and how we ensure people get the services they need. Um, and track the outcomes and ensure we use data to inform where we need to look at gaps, right, and, and fill those gaps um, as a stakeholder approach. But most importantly, our approach as a company is also around what we call this network uh, management process. So it's actually bringing multi -stakeholder, or multiple stakeholders to the table, payers, providers, governments, and the community, and also the patient-centered approach um, to actually how do we address these issues together, right? Because us as a, as a, as a company, are not going to, we're not going to be able to address health equity alone, right? We participate in that with all the folks that are on the phone, I'm sure, in different ways. 
Uh, but together, that's how we address that. In, in the context of COVID, this has really exacerbated um, the needs that, that already were happening, manifest itself in different ways as well, um, not just uh, what, what people's needs were before, but what we've implemented and had to respond to our community is, uh, most importantly, social service agencies who are on our network participating and sending um, re and receiving electronic reports between each other is, you know, what's happening from a discharge planning process from a healthcare perspective? Where is what's happening uh, that we didn't know before? As an example, um, people being discharged can't go back to a 300-square-foot apartment in New York City with six other people because they're going to infect everyone else. So this is around augmenting care. When we call care, we mean health uh, and social services, uh, you know, in the community, right? And, and being able to augment a network to really address those needs and being able to be fast about that. And technology is a huge approach and a big part of, of that um, solution. That's very helpful, um, Dan. So thank you to the panelists for addressing all those questions. I want to also ask another foundational question, maybe not for everybody, but um, for a complex set of reasons, some of which are reflected on this screen, COVID-19 has disproportionately affected minorities through increased infection rates and mortality rates. But it's also stressing food security, I think we've already mentioned that, housing security, education, um, and the workforce where racial and ethnic um, disparities were already present before the pandemic. What do you see? So it's one thing to talk about the problem, and I think all of us can with, um, with some measure of expertise, but I don't want to just admire the problem, right? Um, so let's talk about what you see that is working, even if it's a small measure of progress. What's working now? And what actions might you recommend policy leaders consider to mitigate any additional or expanding negative impact from COVID-19? Yeah, Let me start with sharing. Oh, yeah. go, go ahead, Al. Go ahead, Al. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Desi. Um, so I would actually say living wage. I mean, we've seen some companies respond in real time and offer essential workers um, almost hazard pay. And what I would love to see is that we would actually make that permanent for essential workers. Um, the whole idea of sheltering in place is really a privilege that many people in our country do not have, um, simply because they have to go to work. If they don't work, if they're not on the front line, then they, don't, they can't live, they can't make it. Um, and so, I, again, I applaud companies who are doing that, but I absolutely think that that should be permanent such that we have um, a living wage. Uh, we've seen municipalities um, have also released uh, individuals from jails and prisons. I would love to see more of that. We've all been concerned about mass incarceration in this country, and what we see now is that it is absolutely unsustainable and, in fact, places a large number of persons at risk for an infection in a time like this. And this is a global issue, both the living wage as well as mass incarceration. Um, and so we have to dismantle that system, um, and we need to do it now sooner than later. And we absolutely have to have consensus on the fact that we are actually facing large numbers of per persons, many of whom may be innocent, have not even had a trial at risk for um, infection, but also from death. Yeah, that's very helpful. And it's, I'm glad you mentioned that because public health care people are not always thinking about the incarcerated. That's not usually where their that's mind right. goes. We're typically focused on mm -hmm. insurance coverage, et cetera, access to care. But this is for a different population with other residential um, challenges and huge, massive social services, social disparities questions that led to their incarceration in the first place. So we're not talking about That's violent right. criminals. And I just want you to I want you to sort of refine that. We're talking about folks who have not been necessarily convicted or for nonviolent right. offenders. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, no, so we have to absolutely. So many persons are there in particular languishing in our jails because of the broken bond system. Many people are in, incarcerated. Uh, Leticia knows this from, from Cook County that they're just waiting a public hearing, but they, are, they can't afford to pay bonds. 
So we have to think about how the system, and I, I want to commend you for recognizing that the system is broken. It's not people, it's the system that's broken and shifting that focus from the individual level to the institutional almost macro level. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, let, me, let me ask Sherry if you can speak from the payer perspective, especially a Medicaid managed care organization. Sure. What is working right now um, and what would you recommend we think about, um, uh, you know, scaling perhaps at some level mm -hmm. um, if you were to advise uh, policymakers? I think in um, our area, some things that are working are definitely the availability of testing. That has increased. That is much as there's a much broader availability and access to testing. I think what the gap is with the within the testing process is the um, education. Often the testing environment is simply a test, and then the member or the the individual leaves, and they receive no patient education, uh, no resources, no referral to social services, in, in any in any mechanism. I think the, um, the gap also is a linkage back to primary and preventative care. Um, it's great to test someone, but that really is kind of the end result of lack of initial primary care and preventative care. So I think that those are two areas that we can enhance uh, through our, our clinics and our clinical partners to ensure that they have mechanisms to, uh, uh, to address both of those issues. Um, I think uh, as well what's working locally and to my understanding nationally as well is, is an approach to homelessness. Um, we've seen a lot of momentum related to the homelessness population within the last month, month and a half, and I would hope that that momentum would, would continue. Um, we've seen funding and availability of housing in a pretty quick response. I would hope that that mm -hmm. momentum would continue to address our homelessness, homeless population as well. I think very granularly, some of our um, local and um, municipal leaders could potentially work with the discount stores and the dollar stores within their communities to ensure that fresh fruit, fresh fruit and vegetables are incorporated and, and available within our inner cities and our rural communities who have nothing but uh, a dollar or a discount store. So those are just a few things that can, can um, really uh, move us forward from both a preventative and a response perspective. Okay. Thank you. I know I'm sure Leticia has a lot to add to this question, but I do want to I want to move to the next question on data and perhaps Leticia I'll start with you on this one. Um, so the CDC released uh, data on racial and ethnic uh, breakdown of confirmed COVID cases in the United States a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the, the data were missing for over 50% of the entries. So, you know, we know very well how the inaccessibility of, uh, to, to, you know, to complete data has hampered our efforts, but I'm also a believer that we tend to use that as a crutch sometimes um, because there's a lot that can be done even in the environment of imperfect data. So let me ask you this, and I'll start with you, Letitia, and I think I'll have uh, Dan uh, also weigh in here. How does the gap in data and reporting impede your organization's ability, ability to perform the community outreach you do and to deliver services? Or another way of asking that, what are the workarounds? How, how, how are you able to keep doing what you're doing irrespective of data gaps that might exist? So I think that um, the, the point you made around, you know, sometimes this is a crutch, I think you're right. I don't think that we limit, you know, we have, um, so we have a racial equity task force that was um, kind of created by the mayor in the city, which um, plugged in the Westside United Anchor Hospital Network, which essentially we are included in with a number of different hospitals who are focused, who've been focused for a couple of years on building relationship with um, community and these anchor hospitals to leverage kind of the the institutions to help address um, health equity. And so um, with that task force, one of the things that the mayor asked was for, and, and the city asked, is that they that we had racial and ethnic data collected around COVID positive patients. And so um, really understanding where the burden and 
where um, the disease is. And so I think that, um, you know, that was a piece that kind of was being done already, but in some hospitals better than others. And so that was an explicit request that was made by the leadership. And I think that um, that's helped to kind of helped uh, the city and um, the county to better understand where um, where folks are being impacted. But we don't we didn't need that data to know, you know, where community was where this was going to occur and where we had higher needs. Um, and so for the health system's perspective, you know, I, I kept telling folks, because a big part of my job is to get resources to support our patients, I kept telling folks, I said, we have 5,000 patients that I know for sure that are high need, right, because we have a Medicaid managed care plan. We do assessments where we assess for social determinant needs as well as medical needs. Like, I know for sure that these patients need to be reached. But in addition, there's all those patients who are just not in care, right, and that's a lot of those patients we have focused on around in our housing work. So we've been working a lot on developing linkages for housing, and a lot of those folks just don't touch any system. And so we have to understand that while we do have data around individuals who are engaged in our systems, there are people who are outside those systems that we also have to acknowledge. And so um, part of what um, the health system did around, so around data and around action, um, is that we had a number of patients who were um, COVID positive who could um, recover at home. They didn't need to be in a hospital setting, but we had no place for those individuals to go because a lot of our patients had high behavioral health needs. And so um, what we did is we stood up our own shelter in partnership with the city of Chicago, and we worked to um, provide clinical support for that shelter for those individuals. And it was kind of like a hybrid medical respite kind of model. And, um, and so I think that um, we identified a need because our patients, even in the solutions that were proposed um, and created within the city and the county, our patients were still not being accepted to, to be in those programs for various reasons. And so we had to create a, a solution. You didn't have necessarily hard data, but you knew you knew that because you had direct contact, direct interaction, direct with contact with the patient. Members. I mean, we had the patients who were who were not getting accepted, and so that is where right. we then created that solution. Great, thank you. Now, Dan, you work your work is a little bit different from the you know direct sort of service um, approach that they that they that you know where the is speaking from. Can you comment on how data gaps have impeded your work or not? How have you been able to be successful in creating these networks in the absence of perfect, you know, a perfect data environment? Yeah, so, and I think for, for our partners in health plans and health systems, it's definitely impeded their progress. And I think in a, in a world where maybe we talk about telehealth in a bit, if you don't see the patient as a health system, then you don't have the ability to screen, right? And so you don't know what the needs are until it may be um, too late. And, there's, and, and so that becomes a difficult part for, for our partners. Um, and from a data perspective, I think, you know, prior to COVID, what COVID has helped us understand um, is that we need data, not just from the medical systems, from EHRs and EMRs, we need public health data, so that requires an integrated approach to get the data that we need to make the informed and actionable responses um, for the people in need. Um, and so, you know, part of that is, is where we've helped innovate, as an example, is adding uh, where we have thousands of social services that are, you know, you think about, they're much closer to people's homes uh, than, than perhaps a hospital is. So if they're showing up to the food pantry and we add in an exposure assessment, um, they may be get there to get food, and we capture that food service but we also can capture the exposure to COVID and symptoms related to that, right? So we're capturing it days or weeks in advance of maybe a hospital or, and Sherry and folks on the phone want to know that. They want to know that information way before, right? And so a connected and integrated response allows the effective secure and, and sharing of data between covered entities, non-covered entities, government services in a secure way where the client knows what that's, you know, where that's happening for them. Um, and so, I think it's only enhanced how we think about data exchange, which is what we've been doing between organizations who typically don't communicate with each other around the shared client. Um, but there are many gaps that still exist, um, and it's only what you know in front of your face. If, if, if information is not in the EMR and there isn't racial data, you know, race data or there isn't gender data even, then how do you make even informed responses there because it isn't captured? Um, and so we're helping you know, across the board to give that full picture as much as we can because we're capturing data from outside the medical community. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Al, I want to speak, let me twist this question or tweak it a little bit because you have a unique approach in that you've got a community-based organization that partners with universities. Right? So typically we think of them as well-resourced, sort of the data hubs, if you think about folks who might have access to a lot of data. Um, so speak to that assumption, uh, if that is correct. But you also have a national footprint through your work. So can you speak to how there might be differences from place to place, or if there's an advantage to these partnerships with academic institutions? And again, how does data or, or lack of access to it play into your, your success? Yeah. So I, just, I actually have to put a plug in for the U.S. Census. So I've really been thinking a lot about this issue around data because many of our communities, what we're seeing um, that's been coming out of at the national level is that because of COVID-19, people are being undercounted in the very communities that are being disproportionately impacted. So I really feel like I have to start by just saying that um, I, I just really want to encourage the partnerships and the leaders um, that are listening today to really think about how do they engage the local communities to be counted in this 10-year uh, counting that really will have impact for the next 10 years. So think about, you know, people don't think about the U.S. Census as being a point of data collection that then drives public policy and allocations at the federal and the state level, but it is. Um, and so um, this gives me a chance to kind of think about how do we organize in place um, through community partnerships, through community campus partnerships, even to realign our work um, through these partnerships to make sure that people are being counted uh, at this really critical point around data. But I will say that what we're also seeing in terms of the difference is, is that urban communities probably have greater access to data than in our rural communities. And we're really hearing from a lot of people that this is an area where we need more data. We need to better understand. Um, uh, people need to understand how data, uh, the difference that data can make, and what data needs to be collected around people's health status and health outcome, but also what resources are available in local communities as well. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, I do want to pivot slightly to telemedicine. It's not really a slight. Data and telemedicine are not always yeah. uh, related. <laughs> um, but let me, let me start with Dan. But Sherry, since you also mentioned telemedicine, I'd like to tee you up to follow Dan. Um, so the question is, you know, due to the pandemic, we've seen a huge rise in providers using telemedicine. How can we ensure that telehealth is leveraged in an equitable way? We know that not all communities have equal access to the infrastructure that supports telemedicine um, or telehealth. So what regulatory barriers, if you can point to them, exist, and how do they affect accessibility for uh, minorities. I know there's a lot to unpa unpack there, but Dan, if you can start us off, and I, I want Sherry to weigh in here as well. Yeah, so I, I mean, it's definitely a loaded question and a great question, and I hope this is the next webinar as well about uh, <laughs> technology and, and access to that. So, you know, I, I think it's it's created, a, a, you know, an increased um, you know, focus on the market of telehealth and, and use of technology in general. Uh, to connect with people, uh, and that's going to continue. So that's really, connect, you know, that's made both the supply and the demand side um, get more comfortable with it very, very quickly, uh, which I think is a really important part. Um, but on the demand side, not everyone has access to be able to, to connect in a way that they need to. Um, we've already seen gaps uh, in the sense of um, not having, you know, a phone or a tablet. Um, or a, you know, the computer to be able to connect. And you have to find there are organizations that are now offering that, right, um, to be able to do that. From a regu regulatory perspective, you know, you want to think about you know, Internet access as almost a utility in the future um, and that uh, a utility to all and devices as a utility. But for, for, for now, we need to think about what, uh, where the incentives are aligned and how people can get those, um, I call it hardware right now, 
to the people that need it the most. I'm um, talking about vulnerable populations or elderly that don't have it. Uh, health plans want to do that, and we're seeing health plans distribute those. We're seeing companies distribute those, right? So, you know, back to probably what I've been saying for, for most of the call, this is a community response, and we all need to know what each other is doing uh, because we all, right, have a stake in, in what we need to do to get the, the right technology to the right people. Um, and so as COVID-19 goes into what maybe we call it recovery phase, um, I think this is going to be uh, for, for the long term. Um, people are going to be accessing resources and services digitally. How they do that, they may walk into an organization and get other services right through a network like ours uh, to be able to get, uh, get there. Primary care may be virtual primarily and in person mm. you know, in, as a second source. And so now we need to think about the infrastructure just like we talk about public health infrastructure, the infrastructure to support that type of care in the future. Uh, and governments definitely need to be involved in that conversation. And I think they can take actually a big leading role in how they play in that, um, just as, as well as technology companies like ours, health systems, and health plans as well. Great. Thank you. And I know, Sherry, you have mentioned, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a Medicaid managed care organization in the, in the South, in the state of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. I think I heard you mention earlier in your opening not only are you all doing telemedicine for, say, behavioral health services, but you've provided resources for homeschooling because we know in the pandemic world, mm -hmm. health collapsed, education collapsed, workforce and the yeah. ability to stay employed collapsed. There's this many things that sort of happened all at once that lead to real destabilization. So can you talk about telehealth specifically, but teleservices in general since you're speaking from the payer perspective? Sure. And, you know, from my perspective, that's one of the things that is, ra is, is actually working here in the state. Um, the state of Louisiana really opened up the ability for providers to render telehealth services, both for physical and behavioral health related needs. Um, substance abuse needs, it was, it was, it's pretty broad. Um, so from that perspective, things seem to be working. Where the gap seems to lie is in that, surprisingly, most of our membership have access to a cell phone. It's a smartphone that they lack access to. As Dan indicated, it's, it's access to current technology. Um, many members have, are eligible for SafeLink phones. Um, and, and obtain those. However, that's not smart technology. In many cases, that's still a flip phone that does not allow them to actually connect to telehealth services. So we, we see that as well as the access to broadband, um, as Dan indicated, as, as a great need, um, as well as the, the use of technology. Um, it's great to have a smartphone, but it is the ability to actually connect to your provider and maneuver through the application is, again, an area of need. We've incorporated, we've gotten to the point where we're starting to consider incorporating um, just a tutorial on how to access um, telemed services in our new member orientation. And we encourage our our uh, community health workers and our peer support workers, whenever they're engaging with a member, to do a tutorial on how to access such services, assuming they have a, a smartphone. Great. Thank you for that. I mean, I think there's a lot we can say, and I, maybe Dan is right, maybe this is the next webinar, telehealth, telemedicine, teleservices, because uh, there's a mm -hmm. lot to do there, and we seem to have jumped by leaps and bounds just in the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Let me let me switch to um, outreach in general, and I'll start with Al if he can lead us on this conversation before I start looking at the. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in from participants, so I'm going to turn to that in a second. Please make sure to enter any questions you have on the in the chat. Um, Al, can you can you tell us in your experience? And I actually want Leticia's input here as well. Uh, from the Chicago land uh, perspective, um, what are the best outreach practices? What are the most successful outreach mechanisms for minority communities, communities of color, and or vulnerable communities? How do you get the message across um, around public health messaging, um, education to the extent there's an overlap that always is? Etc. Basically, covering all the work you do. So, does it, 
I think that the outreach really starts in building relationships. People do business with people who they trust and have a trusting relationship with. Many of our partners, in particular academic partners, are focused on research. And what we say to people is um, that the outreach and the work with the community needs to start prior to the awarding of a new grant proposal. It needs to start when you don't want anything. It needs to start when you um, are in a community and you want to be there and you want to, um, to, to get to know people in the community. Um, and so I think that in particular in this environment where we are sheltering in place, it's critically important to draw from those uh, relationships, those long-term relationships, which are oftentimes um, not through an email but through a phone call with people in the community. Who can you reach out to in the community and connect? Um, and so I think that outreach in the future will look very, very different. I mentioned earlier this whole idea and concept of organizing in place. And I think that's what we will have to look at for the future. How do we um, reach out to people who are isolated for physically or isolated, isolated emotionally and bring them into the work that we're doing? Um, so again, starting with that relationship and building upon it, those are the best, that's the best example that I've seen um, to really kind of tear down the wall between the academy and the community or the organization in the community and be responsive to real needs, bringing people into that work. Great. I was going to have Leticia respond to this question, but there's a question from participants. Uh, so for, for Leticia, Leticia, I'll, I'll pitch that to you. How do you incorporate community health workers into your program? Give us a, a quick uh, snapshot. Sure. So, um, so that was one of the, so all of the answers that Al provided um, around the outreach recommendations were the same that I would provide. And I was just going to add the, that what, one of the methods that the health system utilizes is, the, uh, is that we have community health workers part of our care coordination team. We also um, have peer recovery coaches who work with our um, medication-assisted treatment uh, clientele. So, and we have those individuals who work um, in various settings. So they work both um, in the inpatient setting, outpatient setting, but also work in the jail. And so for individuals who are um, engaged and they build that trusted relationship, as um, Al mentioned, um, and establish that re relationship, um, that then helps them when they leave a uh, Whatever, if it's inpatient or if it's from the jail and they go back in the community, they have that same community health worker or peer recovery coach who engages with that individual. And so um, we have embedded that in our, uh, in our programs and our outreach and all of the work that we do. And um, we have found that um, individuals who can effectively build those relationships with our patients are those who are from the community you know, uh, and know the community and, and have been really effective. And so that's how we've been uh, engaging community health workers. Great. Thank you. I, I do want to ask this question. Um, you sort of started us off on this path, Patricia. I want if Al and Dan can respond to the question around um, what's the best advice you can give community-based organizations to help them create partnerships to deliver services in areas that are hard hit by the pandemic. Actually, maybe let me start with Dan. Dan, I think this is actually the crux of your work. Um, so if you can start us off, you have a different take on it, and then Al, uh, you know, chip in with your, with your own perspective. Yeah, so first I want to commend and, and celebrate the amazing work that are done by community-based organizations right now, um, and I, I think they need definitely more praise uh, into what they're doing on the ground and what's happening locally because that's where services are delivered and, and they're doing great work. And I think the advice that I, I give always is, is to band together um, uh, because not, not one organization can solve all these needs. And I think everyone on the phone probably knows that by now. We can't do it alone. And it takes a set of organizations. It takes a trusted set of organizations to work together. I think most importantly, where the market's going uh, funding is coming down um, to communities from federal, from state, and people want to know where to put their dollars. And it's very difficult to put their dollars in singular organizations at a given time, one by one, 
uh, grant by grant. That's very difficult. And where we've seen a lot of success is, is really looking at a, a network, right, of hundreds and thousands of organizations where people can put their money to places where they know they have the data in front of them and where the gaps are and justify that quickly and how much more ROI you're going to get um, from that. So I think that's really important for them to collectively invest in that together. So they need to invest in a structure together of how they actually work together to address those needs, um, whether it's food and employment and housing and behavioral health uh, and so forth. And, and the reason for that is, is because the market is moving towards a payment-driven model. It is not there yet, but what mm -hmm. we're supporting is elevating social services to the same priority level as medical care, right? And so within five years, you will see them be participating in ways that is outside of the way they're being funded now and the capacity that they have now to address the needs because we know how important housing is. Uh, we know how important employment is and, and behavioral health and things that uh, may be paid for outside of the traditional um, medical setting and from a fee schedule perspective. But that's where the market's moving and they need to you know, understand that's where it's happening and go to where the puck is going and be in, in a structure that allows them to participate in that way uh, in an integrated approach with healthcare organizations. Great. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm watching the time. If, if people have questions, please type them into the chat. Um, I'm getting a few uh, sent over for the panelists to respond to. Um, so I'm keeping an eye, I'm sort of multitasking here, but uh, for Al, if you don't mind, uh, you know, providing uh, your thoughts on this, on the same question, what's the best mm -hmm. advice you can give community-based organizations to help them create partnerships? So like, like Dan said, there's no way we, any one organization can do this alone. Mm -hmm. I think Dan is absolutely right. Um, and, and so Dan, today you're, you're, you're spot on on this. So I think that network building and coalition building is going to be essential and critical to the future of this work. Um, we are an international organization made up of many community-based organizations. Uh, our contact information will be shared with you. Um, one of, the, I think, you know, in terms of actionable steps is to connect with groups like Community Campus Partnerships for Health and other um, national or, and international organizations that are engaged in this work. And then secondly, I think, is to build partnerships with allies who have a commitment to social justice and equity. Um, to, to seek out those organizations now more than ever and build alliances with them um, so that we can respond in this present moment but also prepare ourselves for the future. Great. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, let's see, I want to ask this question from one of our listeners. Um, it's around academic research. So the question is, in response to the pandemic, many organizations are prioritizing COVID-related COVID research. What can we do now to turn academic research into actionable tools and resources for states and communities to use? Who would like to take that on first? I can, but I'm, I'm moderating. But I, I, and I think it's better to hear from the panelists. So I, I'll, I'll jump in. I love this question. So Go ahead, <laughs> I, think that, I think it starts by really not just doing research on communities, but doing research with communities. Um, this is a time where we're seeing a lot of national, federal, and philanthropic groups come together to support research on communities. But unless that work is done in partnership with the communities, it really will not have to be the impact that we so desire. So um, those of you who are interested in doing research in the community and wanting to know more, even have more data, do it with the community. Don't just do it on the communities. People are going to be very frustrated at the end of this, this whole experience if um, what we have is just report after report about the abysmal impact of this of COVID-19 and not really lift up the strengths and the resilience of communities. And that story can only be told when it's done in partnership with the community. Great. Um, Terry, there's a question I wanted to ask earlier, so let me, let me come back to that question. Payers, Dan mentioned a few moments ago um, that as we, you know, what the payment system is moving towards, the fact that we will increasingly mm -hmm. focus on social needs as we think about right. paying for care, paying for care that is valued by the, the patient, the customer, 
actually, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, moving away from fee-for-service for our non-health folks who are listening, this, you know, unit-based, um, you know, um, uh, way of paying for care where you basically incentivize delivering care in as many units as possible. So we're moving away from that into something that is more relevant and important and meaningful to the patient, in your case, the member. Can you say a little bit more about what um, plans or payers are investing in right now that we hope to see sustained in the future, given just the very sorry, structural problems that we have going on um, in many communities? Sure, I, I, I would agree with Dan, and I think this is probably another complete webinar as well. As he alluded to, the social <laughs> services, we are seeing more and more state Medicaid contracts incorporating aspects related to social services, as well as value-based purchasing related to social services. I would encourage our social service and community-based partners to track their outcomes, ensure that they have successes and their outcomes are tracked and measured, and to create a, a break book, if you will, of their successes. Um, so that's one thing that I know that we are investing time, energy, and dollars in is those community partners that have trackable, measurable outcomes that we could then downstream and sidestream to our membership. Thank you. So let me ask the final question, because uh, if, if, if it's possible for everyone to weigh in, that will probably take us right up to the edge of our time. How will the pandemic affect things in the long term? What will 2030 look like if you had a crystal ball? What shifts will there be in healthcare delivery? What needs to be prioritized so that no one is left behind and we can look back on some kind of progress that's been made. It's a lot of questions, but pick the one you'd like to weigh in on. Basically, in, based on what we're going through now, what does the future look like? Take 45 seconds to tell us what you think. I'll start with Leticia. Yeah, I, I, I am hopeful about what um, 2030 will, will hold. Um, I think that we ha all all of the folks in the community and across the country and across the world who have been talking about addressing equity and talking about structural racism and working towards um, addressing these structural barriers. Um, you know, this is not something that just happened, right? This is you know hundreds of, hundreds of years of of building systems that um, serve only certain populations, and so I think that. What we need to do is spend the time and do the hard work of deconstructing and building systems that work um, for the people we serve. And so I, I hope that we will be able to take that time and make that take that hard effort and 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 realize the gains that we've had in this um, and and codify them and then continue to work towards our goal in in addressing and providing equity um, and equitable access to to all of the different services um, that our systems provide. Thank you. Uh, Dan? Yeah, I think uh, my hope for, and I, and I know this will happen, is our experience of receiving services 10 years from now is going to look like our experience receiving services from Amazon, right? Uh, and that's what we should be shooting for from an experience perspective, is when I need something, I know where to go, I know how to get it, and I Bye. expect the right service when I need it from a customer experience perspective. Obviously, we have a long way to go. I think the folks on the phone, we could probably solve a good, about, a good amount of that um, if, if we all band together, but that's what it's going to take, and that's what people should expect from an access perspective. Um, and that's why I, I am, we're very excited to continue on our journey, um, because it takes the entire community, and that's what everyone deserves. Okay. Al, 20 seconds. What's, what's in your crystal ball? It'll be different, and it'll be very community-based. Sherry, thank you, Al. I, I would agree. A technology-based delivery system, my hope is that, just like our panel today, that, that silos will be broken down and we will be working much more collectively. Um, and I think that, again, community-based, frontline, peer-supported um, partnerships, 
reaching the most vulnerable. Thank you so much to all four of you for your time and sharing your insights and intellect with us today. Uh, for our listeners and participants, you can see three evaluation questions at the bottom of your screen. Please give us feedback on this webinar while you, well, I guess I should have said that while we were listening to the Q&A, uh, but if you can, before you sign off. Um, I think uh, I want to thank our partners from CCPH and UNC, uh, CHR, that's a lot of acronyms there, but we're almost we're pretty much run out of time. Uh, thank you all for continuing your conversations every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern uh, with your uh, series, Communities and Partnerships, Ensuring Equity in the Time of COVID-19. We hope to see you all there. Thank you so much to Sherry, Leticia, Dan, and Al. And with that, uh, we will end the webinar. Take care, Thank everyone. You, Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Thank you.